IS 36 impairment of assets is one of those accounting standards that is applicable on almost every single accounting entity. So what we are going to discuss today is that what exactly is the reason for the introduction of IS 36 and on what assets IS 36 actually applies. So first of all, let's try to understand this. That IS 36 impairment of assets says that impairment loss arises whenever the carrying amount. What do we mean by the carrying amount? The carrying amount of an asset means its net book value. So whenever the carrying amount of an asset, that is its net book value, exceeds its recoverable amount, so we say that the impairment loss has actually taken place. Now, what exactly is the logic behind this IS 36? So you do study accounting and whenever we study accounting, the first basic concept that we study is called the concept of prudence. And amongst the various things that the prudence concept tells us, one of them is that the assets should not be overstated. One of them is the assets should not be overstated. Now let's try to have a bit of a discussion about this, that what is it that makes the assets to be overstated. Now take an example and the example is assume that you buy a motor vehicle, you buy a car and you buy that car for let's say uh, $500,000. Now you've invested $500,000 in that car. So I'm asking you a question, how would you be recovering your cost which is invested in the car? So most of you would tell me that there are two ways of actually recovering this cost. What are those two ways of recovering that cost? One of them is we could either sell this car and we could recover the money. The other way of recovering the cost is that we continue to use this car and we continue to derive that benefits from this car. So we will ultimately be able to recover whatever the cost that is incurred. Now, assume that if you would sell this car right now, so you are being told that you will get 450,000. If you are going to sell this car, you are being told that the maximum benefit that is going to be derived is $450,000. And what if I continue to use this car? So if you continue to use this car, there would be benefits that would be arising because you would be saving the cost which you pay for the taxis and for the buses and for the trains. Uh, you would be having other benefits which may be that you might lease out the car and you would be having other benefits which is ultimately you would be disposing of the car maybe after one year, after two year, after three year, etc, etc, etc. So all in all, ultimately the maximum benefit that could be derived from the use of this car is let's say 470,000. Now, so what we have established over here is, what we have established over here is that in case if we, in case if we wish to recover our investment in this car, so one thing is we could sell it and the other one of them is we could use it. And the maximum benefit amongst this sale or use is going to be 470,000. This is the maximum benefit that we can derive from this car. Now let's try to have a discussion about it. If this is the maximum benefit that you could derive from this car. So what is happening now? This car has a carrying amount of 500,000. And the maximum amount that could be recovered from this car is $4,70,000. So resultingly, if I continue to carry this car at 500,000 in my balance sheet, that means I would be overstating my assets. And if I would be overstating my assets, this is against the principles of prudence. So in order to overcome this thing, IS 36 impairment of assets was introduced and the major objective of IS 36 is to ensure that the assets are not overstated. Now, what do we mean by this? This means that if there is a situation where the carrying amount, which is 500,000 in this case, is exceeding the recoverable amount, which is 4,70,000. So that means uh, the impairment loss of 30,000 has actually arised. And if the impairment loss of 30,000 has actually arised, so you need to write down the asset by this 30,000. You need to recognize this loss of 30,000 in the PO. So hence, the concept and the logic for the impairment is that it is in line with the principles of prudence, which says 
that the assets should not be overstated. Now let's move further and let's discuss further. So uh, with respect to every single accounting standard, there's a very important principle and which is called the concept of a scope. I repeat, there's a very important principle with respect to every single accounting standard and that is called the concept of a scope. What exactly do you mean by this scope? So whenever we talk about the concept of a scope, the scope actually means applicability of the accounting standard. Generally speaking, a lot of people think that every single asset is tested for impairment under IS 36. So what I would like to clarify to you people is that every single asset is not tested for impairment under IS 36, although there may be a lot of things which qualify the definition of assets, but not everything is tested for impairment under IS 36. So what is important is whenever you study any accounting standard, you should know that to what standards is this accounting a stand, to what assets, to what liabilities, to what items is this accounting standard applicable on. So we are now going to discuss about the scope of IS 36 that what are the things on which IS 36 is applicable and what are the things on which IS 36 is not applicable. So IS 36 says that uh, this standard shall be applied in accounting for the impairment of all assets, all assets other than, other than means these are the exceptions, these are the exceptions. Now, what is the reason for these exceptions? What are these exceptions? Let's explore. Number one of them is the inventories. You do know that we carry the inventories under IAS 2 where we already carry them at the lower of cost or NRV. So when you are already carrying the inventories at the lower of cost or NRV, although inventories are assets, but you don't need to measure the inventories under IS 36 because they are already impaired. The contract assets under IFRS 15, which is the revenue recognition accounting standard, IFRS 15 already gives you a guidance about the measurement of a contract asset. And that measurement already follows the concept of prudence. So there is no need to have another application of IS 36 and write down the asset unnecessarily. So therefore resultingly what happens is under this IFRS 15 also, I repeat under this IFRS 15 also, the IS 36 is not applicable. Let's move a bit forward. Deferred tax assets arising under IS 12. IS 12 gives you guidance about the measurement of the deferred tax asset and IS 12 already follows the concept of prudence while measuring the deferred tax asset, whether that be the deferred tax asset arising on unused tax losses or whether that be the deferred tax asset arising on the share based payment transaction, etc, etc. It is already exercising prudence. It is already giving you guidance. So therefore, IS 36 is not needed. There's this IS 19 employee benefits. Uh, which already applies another concept of prudence. So again, IS 36 is not required. Then what we have is financial assets. Now, what do we mean by financial assets? You've got trade receivable. You've got investment in shares. You've got investment in bonds, etc, etc. So there is a proper guidance available under IFRS 9 about the impairment of financial assets. So the financial assets which fall under IFRS 9 which are being accounted for under IFRS 9 have got proper impairment rules which are laid down under IFRS 9. So you don't have to apply IS 36 to it. Let's move a bit forward. An investment property under IS 40. You've got a choice that you can either carry the investment property under the cost model or you can carry the investment property under fair value model. So if there is an investment property, I repeat, if there is an investment property under cost model, so IS 36 is applicable on it. But if there is an investment property under the fair value model, so IS 36 won't be applicable on it. Why? Because it's already at fair value. It's already being measured at fair value. Already the gain or loss on the movement of it is taken to the PL. You don't have to remeasure it. Then biological assets. They're covered under IS 41, the living plants and the living animals which are held for the agricultural activity, they are held under, they are measured under IS 41. And IS 41 uh, gives you two measurement bases and one of them is 
when the biological assets are measured at fair value less cost to sell. So when you are already measuring them at fair value less cost to sell, so you don't need to separately apply IS 36 to it. And lastly, the non-current assets which are held for sale or the discontinuing operation which are being carried under IFRS 5, it already requires the non-current asset which are held for sale to be measured at the lower of carrying amount or fair value less cost to sell at the time of measurement. So you don't need to separately apply IS 36 on it. Now, why is it important to understand the scope? The reason being, the reason being at times I have come across a students making this mistake that they are being presented with a discontinuing operation or they are being presented with a disposal group which is a group of assets and the associated liabilities. There is inventory mentioned in it, there is receivable mentioned in it. A lot of students what they do is that they start allocating the impairment loss to those uh, inventories, to those receivables. This is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because IS 36 does not apply to inventories. IS 36 does not apply to receivables. Why? Because inventories fall under IS 2. Because receivables, they fall under IFRS 9. So it's very important. Any accounting standard that you study, you have to make sure that you understand the scope of that accounting standard. Now let's move a bit further and discuss a bit a small thing uh, which is also important to know with respect to IS 36 applicability. Now, um, you invest in a subsidiary, that means you are acquiring shares of a subsidiary. But once you invest in the shares and you get control, so that, that investment become a subsidiary. So if it would have been a normal investment, then IFRS 9 would have been applicable to it. But since it has become subsidiary, so the impairment loss on the subsidiary would be measured under IS 36. Similarly, you have got an investment in a company, if it becomes associate, then IS 36 impairment of asset would be applicable. Till that time it is not an associate, till that time you don't exercise significant influence, it's IFRS 9. But once you start exercising significant influence, it's IS 28 and IS 36. Next, the joint ventures, again IS 28 is applicable on the joint ventures or the IFRS 11 joint arrangements. So any investment which meets the definition of joint venture, so impairment on such investment is performed under IS 36 and not under IFRS 9. So that marks the conclusion of the discussion on the scope paragraph of IS 36. So what we have done is we have discussed the reason, the logic for the introduction of IS 36 and the scope which is the applicability of IS 36. Hopefully it would have been beneficial for you people. Thank you.